Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. Well, good day to you, brothers and sisters. Going to show you something cool as always. I've got another book of the Bible done for you in reference to my series called uh, See um, the Book Like Never Before. In reference to looking at books of the Bible be uh, between Psalms and Malachi. Looking at each one of those. Um, with your 70th week of Daniel glasses on, and you'll see it, and you'll understand it like never before. So I've done Isaiah, I've done Jeremiah, and now I'm finally getting around to uploading the one uh, I did a few weeks ago on the three chapters of the book of Joel. So if you've ever wondered about the passages in the book of Joel, uh, especially in chapter 2, and you can't figure out uh, which army is which? Is it the Antichrist army? Is it a mortal army like the ten kings who turn against the beast at the return of Christ? Um, and it gets a little confusing because you've got Almighty God, Yah, the Holy One of Israel, calling uh, certain armies his army, his camp. But yet it sounds like it's talking about the Antichrist army. And I'm going to help you walk through it. I've got this document that uh, uses background color coding as well as font color coding. And we're going to match up the three chapters of the book of Joel with the seals, trumpets, and bowls of Revelation. And help you get all of that straight. A lot of people have wrestled with especially chapter 2 of Joel. And uh, I've been uh, working hard on understanding all of this now for six and a half years. I've... I keep going back to the garden. I ask, I seek, I knock, I ask, I seek, I knock. You know, Father, my Lord Jesus, will you please meet with me in the garden? Tell me more about the 70th week of Daniel. And I come before them as a child. And I do that every day. And I've done it now 25 hours a week for six and a half years. That doesn't mean anything. A lot of people make that claim. But I put the work in, and I'm going to show you some things and ways that you can prove which army is which in the book of Joel. It's going to help you tremendously. And, and in other words, I don't read over anything. I take my time, and I make sure that I understand every single word of every single verse. All right. For example, you know, when we're talking in Joel about the Garden of Eden is before this northern army. And how Israel is like a garden of Eden. Okay, It's little clues like that that help you. In other words, it can't be a northern army passing through the land at the seventh bowl. If the land of Israel looks like the garden of Eden that has not undergone the curse yet. Do you see what I mean? So it must be the first northern army. In other words, the Antichrist northern army. Gog the Assyrian, who shall arise to power in Nineveh. Mozo Iraq, says Nahum chapter 1. It's the uh, his army called the hired razor, fly in the bee, which shall be used as a rod of anger in chastisement by Almighty God against his people. All right, it's, so it's clues like that that I look for. So I'm going to help you walk through all three chapters. Um, this information should be seen valuable to not only a babe in Christ, but also someone who's been teaching at the seminary for 30 years. Okay, This information can be used by everyone within the body of Christ. Don't think that you're too high up to accept this understanding, and don't think that you're too new, all right, to be, uh, you're too new in regards to following Jesus to even begin to understand all of that. Don't think that. We're all the same. All right. We're all on the same level when it comes to Jesus's looking at us. All right. Now, we all have different gifts within the body of Christ. Your gift may be something much different than teaching the 70th week of Daniel with true understanding. You know. You may have a, be a shepherd of a large flock, and you have many roles to do in regards to taking care of them and meeting all their needs. My role is to teach the upcoming 70th week of Daniel. That's my gift. That's my mission. All right? So 
You may be the preacher of a mega church, but don't think that you shouldn't listen to someone lowly like me, all right, least of the flock, because you think there's nothing that I can teach you or show you. All right, so we're all on the same level as far as coming to the feet before the Holy Spirit and going to the garden to ask, seek, and knock, and he shall open the door. All right, he'll open that door to understanding. Matthew 7 is Revelation 4. That's what Jesus is talking about, the Word of God, in Matthew 7, explaining to you what's meant by Revelation 4's open door of the things that shall come to pass. All right, so let's get busy. So again, I've created these Word documents. I've done Isaiah, Jeremiah, here is Joel. I give you some scriptures. I'm going to let you read the, uh, them on your own. And then we're going to look at the legend for the color coding. <clears throat> I'll read that to you. And then we'll go right into the three chapters. Again, matching them up with uh, the seals, trumpets, and bowls of Revelation. Uh, let me also say this before we really get started. You've got to understand... What is in the scroll that Jesus is loosing the seven seals of so he can spread it open on the table? In other words, when the seventh seal is broken and the worthy lamb, the only one worthy to open the scroll, okay, what's in it? Some people might say, well, it's the kingdom of God or it's his appearing. Or some people might say it's the day of the Lord. Well, it is the day of the Lord, right? That comes like a thief. That is what is in the scroll. Now, listen to me, brothers and sisters. What happens during the day of the Lord depends on what Israel does during the fifth seal test. Now, this test comes upon the entire earth. But what how Israel reacts to it during the fifth seal determines the start to the day of the Lord. Here's what I mean by that. Father has already determined that he's going to bring the promised curse of Deuteronomy 32, Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus. Okay, he's already told Israel's forefathers, he's already told Moses, here's what I'm going to bring upon the last generation of Israel. They're going to not only pay for their own sins, uh, but they're also going to pay for their forefathers' sins. It's this curse, all right, when their forefathers broke the oath that's promised on the last generation of Israel, all right? Fathers bringing that during the second half of the 70th week of Daniel. In other words, it's established, it's scheduled to be uh, the first 90% of the day of the Lord is that promised curse upon his people to do what? To remove their dross. Do you understand? Zechariah 13 should be coming to mind. Isaiah 1 should be coming to mind. All right, he has to purge her. His, Because remember, who is the bride of the Messiah? Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who my elect one, who is his bride? And we like to say, oh, it's the body of Christ from the last 2,000 years, but that's not correct. Jesus, Lord God, Jesus is coming back to wed a bride. Who is his bride? It's the holy people and the holy city. That's why the wedding hall is there at Zion, Jerusalem, right? The Valley of Jehoshaphat, the Valley of Decision. There is the wedding hall of Matthew 22. All right, Revelation, uh, excuse me, Zechariah 9, Revelation 19, Zechariah 14. There it is. So he's marrying all of the chosen ones from the last 6,000 years. And I do not mean all of this chosen seed line of Jacob. That's not what I said. The chosen ones from the last 6,000 years are going to be immortalized. They will be part of the bride of Christ, the Messiah. 
Jesus of Nazareth? The foolish virgins who remain alive after the battle of the great day of God Almighty, all right, all the remnant of Israel who were not glorified but stayed alive and did not take the mark of the beast, when Jesus sets his hand a second time and recovers the remnant and brings them back, and they begin rebuilding Jerusalem because there's not going to be anything left standing in Jerusalem when Jesus gets done with it on the night of his return. Isaiah 17, 14, Zechariah 14, 7, at evening time, twilight, time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, the time that the virgin comes out to draw water from the well, it shall happen that the entire assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill at twilight. Hallelujah. I know that's getting a little deep for some of you. All right. But Jesus is marrying the holy people and the holy city. Now you might say, well, brother, where does the followers of Jesus from the last 2,000 years fit into all of that? Well, what did you learn in Galatians? What did you learn in Hebrews? What did we learn in Romans? We are grafted onto that tree that Jesus is the root of, that tree called Israel, my elect. Uh, the green olive tree with lovely and good fruit. Jesus, the root of Jesse, the root of David. All right? We're grafted onto that tree. Now, if you say, well, brother, are the majority of them on the tree that get glorified at Jesus' appearing? Is the majority followers of Jesus who are Gentiles from the last 2,000 years or the chosen ones from the called seed line during the first 4,000 years? I have no idea, brothers and sisters. I can care less. But I know together all of the chosen ones make up the bride of Christ. Again, but also the mortals who weren't glorified, who will be at the great white throne judgment, but they're going to be alive in their mortal bodies and learn and be taught during the millennium. And they're going to make beautiful babies during the millennium. And then when the nations of the world who remain alive through all of this and begin having babies and sickness and disease are gone from the earth and everyone's flourishing and women are not instead of having two or three babies are having 10 or 12 babies it's going to be the greatest nursery of all time on planet earth when jesus is king all right they would have it no other way they the trinity the family of yah they would have it no other way you talk about a lot of babies crying not because they're sick or diseased it's, again, this is going to be the greatest nursery of all time. But more than half of the people on the planet will be dead by the time Jesus appears and definitely after, by the end of the battle of the great day of God Almighty when Jesus is bringing the worst earthquake that mankind has ever known on the day the towers fall throughout planet Earth on all seven continents. All right, all of the wicked ones, all of the evil ones, all who are of their father, the devil, they have the spirit of their father, the devil. They must all be identified through the mark of the beast and be destroyed at Jesus' coming. I know we're getting a little deep, but you have to understand that this curse is coming and will be the first, the seven trumpet judgments, time of Jacob's trouble the time of the seven troubles of Job 5, this will be the first 90% of the day of the Lord that's in the scroll. And then the other 10% is that battle of the great day of God Almighty, which shall last for many days, beginning on the last day of the age that Jesus is appearing after the seventh bowl is poured. All right, four, five, six weeks after the seventh trumpet is blown by the seventh angel. And then at the right moment, Lord God Almighty will descend with his son sitting to his right hand, coming down, descending with a shout, all right, of, um, and be riding on the swift clouds on the cherub described in Ezekiel chapter 1. Hallelujah. And he, Jesus, will be brought not only to be 
named king of the planet and the universe from Jerusalem. It's also his wedding day. It's also the day he feeds the poor and needy who are still in their mortal bodies left alive. But it is also the day that he attacks his enemies and all who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. He comes as a commander of the Lord's army. Did you know that? And that blows people's mind. And they go, yeah, I remember reading something in Revelation 19 about being part of the armies of heaven that follow Jesus on white horses. Yes, you do. And you are considered an army. Now, we don't have to go into depth about what that entails, whether you're uh, shaking a tambourine or blowing a trumpet, you know, or playing a harp or whatever, or just singing and dancing and rejoicing, whatever that entails. We don't have to go into that, but you need to understand that when he blows the last trumpet quickly, suddenly, swiftly, speedily, all right, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, this is a mustering, Isaiah 13 says, of his army for battle. Did you know that? That's why Jesus blows the last trumpet. It's a commander's attack sound with a shout, attack! <laughs> it is done. What does the it is done mean of Revelation 16, 17? Israel's dross has been purged. He doesn't have to marry a dirty bride now. You might say, why do you keep bringing Israel into this? Because that is who his bride is. Israel. And the kingdom that's coming is called, in Micah chapter 4, the kingdom of the daughters of Jerusalem, Zion. That's the name of the coming kingdom of God. Has anyone ever told that to you? And you might say, why do you keep bringing Israel into this? Well, I'm not. God is. That's who Jesus is marrying. You are grafted onto their tree. Now, before you, uh, you know, think I'm just doing some type of messianic teaching. First of all, it's not a messianic teaching. It's the word of God. And I'm not messianic. Not that I'd mind to be, but I'm not. At least not yet. But you got to know your Bible. He's not coming back to just simply marry uh, the followers of Jesus Christ from the last 2,000 years. What do you think Ezekiel 37 is trying to tell you? Hallelujah. All right. Now, I said that the scroll contains the day of the Lord, but it's up to Israel during the fifth seal test whether they denounce the Antichrist and his false prophet and bow and knee to Jesus or not. If by some miracle that Israel wises up, even while under strong delusion that's not even going on yet, do you see how hard it would be for Israel? If they can't even see the truth now, imagine when the 42 months of strong delusion mentioned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 begins. Can you imagine how hard it's going to be on Israel? So there's less than a 1% chance that they will do what Father calls repent. If they repent in mass, to include their leadership, their, their religious leaders, okay, their mayors, their governors, all right, their school teachers, their college professors, if the majority of Israel denounces the Antichrist, refuses his mark, and say, we will not bow before you. We are waiting on Jesus Christ, our Messiah, our groom. If they did that, Father says in Malachi 4 and other passages in the Bible, I will relent from bringing the promised curse upon my people. What that means is the day of the Lord is still coming after the six and seven seals are loosed, but it does not, it won't be the seven trumpet judgments against his people. We'll go right into the return of Christ the afternoon that the sixth and seventh seals are loosed. Bam! Here comes Jesus. Here comes the glorification. Here comes the mustering of the Lord's army. Here comes the wrath of the Lamb at the first trumpet. The first trumpet will be the last trumpet. There'll be no Gog the Assyrian hired razor flying to be army passing through the land en route to Egypt to collect up the spoils, plundering the land. That won't happen. Why? Because that's all part of the promised curse. 
But again, the odds that Father will do that and be able to do that and that Israel will pass the fifth seal test that lasts for about 12 to 13 months. And we know this because of all these how long countdowns. And if you study with me, you'll see why I can, how I can prove 12 or 13 months length of the fifth seal test. Um, now, the 42 months begins during the fifth seal, 30 days following the abomination of desolation event in Jerusalem, and last until the seventh trumpet is blown by the seventh angel. That's the 42 months. But if Father doesn't have to bring the curse, then you only see Israel being tested for 12 months. All right? Then the afternoon, the sixth and seventh seal is loosed. First trumpet, here comes Jesus in the air. Now you may say, well, brother, be careful. We don't want to set up the Antichrist for success when he comes th passing through the land on the afternoon of the sixth and seventh seal is loosing. And you're absolutely correct. You need to understand that when Jesus comes, whether it's at the seventh bowl, where there's a 90% chance that's when he'll come, or at the first trumpet, if Israel, by some miracle, passed the fifth seal test, which they won't, but we should be praying for it. Regardless of when Jesus comes, there'll be no mistaking. All right, there'll be no uh, miracles done by the false prophet or the Antichrist that can come close to the glory of Jesus Christ when Father brings him riding on the swift clouds on his cherub, all right, above Jerusalem. You're going to know when Jesus appears. That's the day that the towers fall. In other words, it's not the um, uh, earth shaking as Gog passes through the land at the first trumpet. Okay, It's not the seventh trumpet earthquake in Jerusalem. This appearing of Jesus Christ earthquake will be felt on all seven continents, and all of the buildings are coming down. Unless a building can be just, you know... Um, judged by God as having a no, uh, ha never been a part of anything wicked, then maybe he might leave it standing. All right, but you better be out of the cities. If you're not ready to be glorified at the coming of Jesus, you better be out of the cities. It is the day the towers fall. But we need to quit talking so much about the possibility of Jesus being brought by Father at the first trumpet, because it's less than 1%. So let's stick with, with uh, what's going to happen. Jesus is not going to appear and be brought by Father till the seventh bowl is poured. So that's what's in the scroll. It's the day of the Lord, which is the seven trumpet judgments to uh, purge away her dross. Then the shout, it is done in Revelation 16, 17. After all of the nations have gathered their representatives and leaders and generals and military powers have gathered to the Middle East, especially the mountains of Israel. All right. And you have all of Israel's evil neighbors and surrounding peoples have come to Jerusalem to try to take it. All right. Then you have the appearing of Jesus Christ at the seventh bowl. So, Let's get started in the book of Joel. This work of love is dedicated to my dear Lord God and best friend, Jesus of Nazareth. Hallelujah. You can read all these verses I have for you. I like uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 6 through 11. It tells you why these things happened in the past to serve as examples of what's going to happen during the 70th week of Daniel. Um you have Father, even back in Deuteronomy 18, talking about uh, Jesus, his son. Acts 4, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. I, I put this verse here to remind us of what Hosea 6 says, verses 1 through 3. It's going to be the greatest moment of healing that this earth has ever seen. When Jesus appears. Of course, I'm talking about uh, the changing into immortal spirit slash physical bodies of the bride of Christ from the last 6,000 years. All right. 
this the spirit of healing. By him this man stands before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Hallelujah. These are the type of things that the Holy Spirit is going to be making your body speak. You'll be under the, the control of the Holy Spirit. And it's verses like this. Don't try to memorize this. You can try to memorize it, but you're not going to say it in front of the wicked, in front of the world, as you're being put on trial, Christians. Yes, you're going to be here. All right. Hallelujah. You'll do just fine. You'll make Father proud. But these are the type of things that the Holy Spirit's going to have you speak before the world. It might be just before your community, before your county before your state, when you're being rounded up, you troublemakers, followers of Jesus Christ, who keep saying that the Gog the Assyrian is the Antichrist and his false prophet is being possessed by Satan as well, when you're saying these things, these are the type of things that the Holy Spirit's going to use, all right, to teach the world the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, right here begins the color coding. You see, I have a yellow background, black font, green background, black font, gray background, white font, and you see the rest. Medium red, black with white font, gray with black font. You see all the different coatings? This will help you understand because all of the book of Joel, almost, almost every verse will have one of these uh, color codes assigned to them. And then you go back to this legend and you'll see what it's referring to. And it'll help you understand which seal, trumpet, or bowl. <clears throat> well, brothers and sisters, I'm not going to take time in this video lesson to read all of this for you. I want you to do it on your own. All right, see, the yellow is the fifth seal test, which lasts 12 to 13 months. And it's also Father's warning, begging his people to repent. You see uh, the sixth and six, sixth and seventh seal loosing that time to don sackcloth of Amos after uh, Amos chapter eight. This green is the reasons Father gives for bringing the promised curse upon his people. And you see the gray font uh, with a uh, gray background with white font. All right. This is talking about the time of the end battle late in the fifth seal when Egypt and its allies make uh, a last ditch effort to destroy uh, the king of the north, Gog the Assyrian's army, and they fail by the river Euphrates. And then shortly after that, just a few months after that, the king of the north reconstitutes himself and passes through Israel, begins the promised curse. Uh, here in red with black font, this is the, the seven trumpet curse coming upon his people. Um, black is really interesting because this has to do with prophecies in Joel about the 70th week of Daniel. Things that you need to stop and take notice of which help you determine uh, even the season of our Lord's return. Here we have the first northern army in gray this is the antichrist army even though it may have titles like his camp his army in reference to father all right you got to be careful this is his the first northern army this the second northern army is actually uh, the 10 kings who turn against the beast and burn her with fire mentioned in revelation 17 led by the appointed general who lifts a banner to the nations Okay, of Jeremiah 51, Isaiah 13, and, and such. Uh, but this is the first northern army, the Antichrist army from the north, in gray. And uh, blue with white font is all these passages in the Bible that talk about, wait on your Lord until the day he rises up to take plund plunder, which gives us clues. And you see Father begging his people, wait, wait patiently, keep your garments, stand fast. 
hold out, in other words, until my appearing. I have to wait till all the my assembly of kingdoms are finished and the sixth bowl is complete. Then the dross has been purged. Then I can bring Jesus to marry a clean bride. Hallelujah. You've got uh, a green with, I think it's white font. That's pretty bright. Hopefully you can see it. All right. Remember, if you download it to your desktop, you can zoom in, you can zoom out, even on your smartphones. This color represents the passages that are only referring to the good mortal armies that are part of the Ten King Nation Alliance during the Battle of the Great Day of God Almighty. Here we have purple and yellow font. This is the appearing of Jesus Christ fighting as a warrior, leading his army, commander of the Lord's army on the day of his fierce anger. All right, that's what that color represents. Uh, red with yellow font, that is more information about the ten kings who's not even going to live, leave a child alive in Baghdad. Okay, the Bible gets that specific. Blue with uh, dark blue with light blue font. This color represents the reports that go out throughout the beast kingdom concerning uh, Jesus attacking the beast cities and threshing the various threshing floors from the Nile River Basin to the Euphrates River Basin. To be more specific, the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River Basin. And uh, all the terror and the shame that's going to be in the hearts of the people from the beast cities. Okay, when Jesus is threshing them throughout the Middle East. This teal with black font, this is when the Lord sets his hand a second time after the battle of the great day of God Almighty, during the early days of the millennium when he recovers the Israeli remnant, because they're going to be under the yoke in all the beast cities from around the world. The Bible says in Zechariah 13, uh, which is future, it's tied to Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14 is just a continuation of Zechariah 13. All right, one third of Israel will be in captivity by the end of the seven trumpet judgment curse. Two thirds of Israel will be dead. I am sad to report that if you didn't know that. All right, don't, don't let anyone tell you that Zechariah 13 is a past prophecy. It's tied to Zechariah 14's return of Jesus Christ. It is exactly why Israel needs to repent. So Father can relent by the end of the fifth seal before Father makes a decision. Let's continue on with the promised curse. All right. And you can read the rest of these. Hallelujah. All right. So we got a real detailed color code here for you. Let's go ahead and begin. Now I'm using this same color code throughout all of these books of the Bible between Psalms and Malachi. Again, this is only the third one I've done in the series. I plan and I hope, God willing, that eventually I'll finish all of them between Psalms to Malachi. Check back often. And I post all of these, I upload all of these to the folks at keepandshare.com. Keepandshare.com. All right. I'll leave links to this. And once you uh, follow that link to Keep and Share to where my folders are, I have over 170th week of Daniel files in the folder that you can view or download it's your choice do with them as you wish you have my permission share them please here we go now chapter one consists of uh, 20 verses you see red with black font gray with black font only two different color codes for chapter one the red is the actual seven trumpet curse on Israel. That's coming. It hasn't happened yet. This is what's coming upon present day Israel very soon. I believe in the next five to 15 years. Now this gray with black font, this represents what? What do we say in the legend? The Antichrist army, Gog the Assyrian. And no, Gog the Assyrian is not some war prior to the start of the 70th week of Daniel, like some believe. No, Gog the Assyrian uh, is leader of the Assyrian alliance, who helps and guards the children of Lot, mentioned in Psalm 83. 
Psalm 83, Ezekiel 38, Isaiah 7 and 8. Do you get it? All the eights? Okay, this is the same first northern army that passes through the land in Daniel 11:40b to begin the seven trumpet judgment curse because Israel's forefathers broke the oath. And the curse in the oath is also mentioned in the 9-11 passage of the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, verse 11. Here it comes, this promised curse of Deuteronomy 32. But yes, let's begin. Hear this, you elders, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days, or even the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children, and the, and the Lord expects that to make it all the way through to the last generation of Israel, which is what? Alive today. And here we are talking about it. So it has made its way through the ages, all right? And their children, another generation. This means keep it going, keep this information going, this word of God, and make sure it makes it to the last generation. And the Holy Spirit made sure it made it to the last generation. Now you might say, yeah, you're reading it, but they're not. That's a good point. It's available to them. Verse 4, what the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Again, this is Father's way of introducing the subject of the coming curse. Israel is going to starve to death. Israel's not going to have any water to drink. Israel's buildings are going to be on fire. They're going to be attacked by their enemy. Such a large force, it says, that Israel's army won't even be able to go out to fight. It'll be so massive, so quick, that the military is just going to be uh, helping trying to save little children from burning buildings. I mean, they're not even going to go out to fight. There's no use of even having a plane lift off. And you might say, what are you saying, brother? Well, let's let the Word of God tell us. But when you study all of these Word documents, Psalms all the way through Malachi, you'll see what I'm saying is right. I'm not like working for the enemy, trying to... Uh, to put fear into the IDF's hearts. No. I love Israel. That's why I'm warning them. As long as you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are Israel. All right. I'm warning them. This is father spanking that's coming if they don't pass the fifth seal test. They still have time to repent. And if they don't, then this is what's coming. They won't even be able to initiate a fight. Now, having said all that, the results of all this will be Israel uh, helping Jesus rule the planet. Okay, Israel will win in the end, but two-thirds of them are about to die. It doesn't have to be that way. Do you understand? It does not have to be that way if we, Gentile followers of Jesus Christ, do our job Quit playing church on Sunday, start teaching this, start believing it, start warning Israel, this is what's coming. There's, And we might be able to get that 1% chance up to 5%. You see my point? Father's expecting a lot of work out of us during the next 5 to 10 years. Not playing church one hour a week. I'm not trying to uh, diminish the importance of going to church. It sounds like I am. I don't mean that. I'm just saying we should be at church 20 hours a week. That's my point. Don't go play church and sing songs for one hour. Okay, this is about to go down, people. All right, make Father proud. All right, Israel's being warned to the last generation. Here it comes, and this is how it's going to go down if you don't repent. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. Why? It's going to be the worst famine upon Israel of all time. Even days of old will not see anything like what's about to happen to Israel. Can't drink the water. No shipments of bottled water are coming in. Gog the Assyrian is going to stop all of that. No flights in, no ships in. All right, just bombarded, bombardment, 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 explosions, explosions, explosions going on for months and months and months. Two-thirds will die. 
for a nation has come up against my land. Now here it sounds like Father's not claiming it, but you're going to see when we get to Joel 2, Father is claiming this nation that's coming against his land. He lets it, and we see that in Isaiah and Jeremiah. Go look at my other word documents. See Isaiah like never before. See Jeremiah like never before. All right, you'll see Father. He's claiming it. He even whistles for Gog the Assyrian's army. In Isaiah 7 and 8, For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion. This is not Jesus' army. This is the Antichrist army. Gog the Assyrian. That won't be the name he'll use. But Magog is in Assyria, Turkey, Syria, and, and Iraq, that region. For a nation has come up against my land. And we'll learn that this nation is not one nation. It's not like here comes Turkey. This nation is going to be dozens of nations. Even from parts of uh, the Nile River Basin is going to be part of this army that gathers in, in along the Euphrates River and comes down the Euphrates River like it's overflowing. Even people will fly in from all around the world to be part of this army. We, we kind of saw that with ISIS. ISIS-1, if you will. This might be real similar to like an ISIS-2. He has fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. You know, you see pictures of World War I, World War II, France, Germany, right? All the other nations. When all these tanks come through and this military equipment comes through and everything's on fire and exploding, all right? There's no food or water to be had. No gas, no electric. No cars running, no buses, no trains. All right? Everybody's just hiding, praying their building doesn't collapse on them. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. Remember this promised curse, the Bible says, which not only affects Israel, but will eventually spread to all seven continents of the world. We're told that this will be worse than anything that has ever happened on planet Earth before. But thank goodness the Lord is making sure that he's keeping one third of the Israelis alive. Zechariah 13, that's not, that's not me making up numbers. Now, they won't be found within the border of Israel. Isaiah 4 and Isaiah 6 says that only 10% of Israel will be found by Jesus, all right, and be there in Israel at Jesus' appearing, if he, Father, has to bring the curse. Only one-tenth, that's called the holy stump. But you're going to have one-third of Israel working as slaves for many, many months in these beast cities, under the yoke, under the whip, kind of like what happened in Egypt, except much worse. They're really going to be hated by Lebanon, Gaza, Jordan, Turkey, Syria, Iraq. Is all of those named in the Bible? Yes, several times. These are the beast cities, the evil neighbors, surrounding peoples of Zechariah 12, Jeremiah 12, these people who are going to plot evil against the Lord and the Lord's inheritance. They're coming, brothers and sisters. I know they're smiling now and talking nice and going to sign all of these agreements to share oil, to share gas, to build pipelines and refineries, this web of the beast kingdom. While we're all looking at Pope Francis, the beast kingdom is being built before our eyes. And Israel is going to fall prey to this. And they're going to, in their eyes, need this Antichrist to bring them out of this. But they should turn to Yah, the Holy One of Israel, and His Christ, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But they won't. Lament like a virgin, verse 8. Lament like a virgin, girded with sackcloth. Okay, that's in reference to Amos 8. All right, you'll know when the sixth seal is loose. Why? Because all of Israel is going to be donning sackcloth. And here comes Gog the Assyrian with such a massive force, Israel know they can't survive. And you might say, where is America during all this? Brothers and sisters, I don't know. I'd be lying to you if I said I knew. I don't know. But I know we won't be helping them on that day. 
We won't be helping them for the seven trumpet judgments. Now, I think under strong delusion, America is going to be, uh, the chances are pretty high that we're going to be fornicating with the beast city. And when we see all this Christian persecution during the fifth seal, prior to the sixth seal attack, see, this is a, this attack is the first trumpet. It's on the same afternoon, the sixth seal is loosed at 12 o'clock noon, darkness falls, just like when Jesus was being crucified. That's what Father's doing here, sending a message to his people. You should have took, pushed the easy button. You should have pushed the easy button. All right, that's why Amos 8 tells you that darkness is going to fall to loose the sixth seal, this time to dawn sackcloth at 12 o'clock noon. I'm going to assume and guess that the seventh seal is loosed at 3 p.m. Do you see the story that, our, that I believe our Lord is telling? And then what happens after 30 minutes of silence? Radars go off everywhere. Here they come, this massive horde. This treacherous dealer has dealt treacherously, just like the people of Israel have dealt treacherously with their Lord. All right. The wicked plans, the e crafty counsel, the evil plans, the evil plots of all of Israel's surrounding peoples and evil neighbors. Jeremiah 12, Zechariah 12, leading up to Zechariah 13 and 14. Here they come. Israel's been tricked. So what's father going to do? He's going to bring terror. He's going to bring shame. He's going to bring death and suffering on his own people during the seven trumpet judgments using, like he's done in the past, he uses a mortal army from the north, just like he did in the past with King Sennacherib, King Nebuchadnezzar. Father's going to do it again, this time worse than ever before. He's going to purge away that dross of his people. He's bringing shame and terror and death and, and persecution and, and uh, much suffering upon his people. And then he's going, when it's done, at Revelation 16, 17, when that voice shouts before the throne, it is done. Then what? Here comes Jesus. Father brings him. And now the enemies of Israel, it's their turn to suffer shame and terror and burning and suffering, and all the plagues. It's their turn. You got it? But now, during this red background, this is the seven trumpet judgments against Israel. Beginning the same afternoon, the sixth and seventh seals are loosed. Be ashamed, you farmers. Well, you vine dressers for the wheat and the barley, because of the harvest of the field has perished. The vine has dried up. And the fig tree has withered, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the, and the apple tree, and all the trees of the field are withered. What message is Father trying to send his people? You're a dead branch to me, Israel. But actually, Israel as a whole is not a dead branch, it's a diseased branch. He's going to cut off all the withered branches, and he's going to graft on the uh, Gentile followers of Jesus Christ. All right. So he's going to cut off and burn the tares. He's also going to cut off and burn his enemies. Hallelujah. Well, you vine dressers for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished, the vine has dried up, and the fig tree has withered, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, and all the trees of the field are withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, you priests. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come lie all night in sackcloth. Again, see Amos chapter 8. That's that first night that they have now are under attack by this huge northern army. Led by Gog the Assyrian. Now, in Psalm 83... You see that one verse, I think it's verse 8, it talks about Assyria is there also. Psalm 83 describes Israel's evil neighbors and surrounding peoples who do crafty counsel against Israel with Gog the Assyrian. 
Listen to me, brothers and sisters. Don't let Ezekiel 38 and Psalm 83 confuse you. This is the Daniel 1140b pass through the land. On the day the first trumpet is blown, they're the same attack on Israel. What Ezekiel 38 shows you in regards to a list of nations is the official Assyrian alliance. Now what you see in Psalm 83 is the children of Lot, evil neighbors surrounding peoples of Israel that are helped and guarded by the Assyrian alliance of Ezekiel 38. And that's shown in Psalm 83 in verse 8. They're being helped and guarded by Ezekiel 38's list of nations. And they combine to make this huge force that has tricked Israel and who's coming against Israel. Do you understand? It's not two separate wars. There's not going to be this war on Israel before the first seal of Revelations ever loosed. Israel shall not be uh, attacked by any serious force again until... The first trumpet is blown, and it's going to happen very soon, brothers and sisters. I believe in the next 10 years, that first trumpet's going to be blown. You're going to see a lot of wheeling and dealing for the next 5 to 10 years. There'll be no war on Israel before the seven trumpet judgment curse war. Oh, no, that's what's next on the schedule of Almighty God. Again, Ezekiel 38, list of nations, help and guard. They're the Assyrian alliance, the children of Lot, evil neighbors of Israel, surrounding peoples of Israel, of Psalm 83. Combined, they make up the hired razor fly in the bee of Isaiah 7 and 8, and here they come at Daniel 11:40b. Gird yourselves and lament, you priest. Well, you who minister before the altar, come. Lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God, for the grain offering and the drink offering are all withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, cause sacred assembly. You have to understand, brothers and sisters, once Father says, okay, it's official, I am going to bring the curse as scheduled. Once Father says that at the end of the fifth seal test of this hour and trial mark of the beast test that begins with the house of Israel, all right, First and second Peter should be coming to mind. All right. This curse that begins with the house of God. When father decides it's coming, it can't be stopped. Do you understand? Once the first trumpet is blown, actually once the first, once the first, uh, once the sixth seal is loosed, it can't be stopped. Father can't go, oh, whoa, Gog the Assyrian. You're doing way too much damage to my people. Ease up a little bit. Oh, there's not going to be any elect alive. Yes, God does say that about Jerusalem. And he brings Jesus a few days early. All right. And when you see that in uh, Matthew, he's going to bring Jesus a few, a few days early. So instead of Daniel, the prophet, having to wait on his resurrection to life, 1,335 days following the fifth seal abomination of desolation event in Jerusalem, well, Daniel's going to get to come back to life a few days before that. But just a few days. All right. It'll be well after the blowing of the seventh trumpet. So enough time for these nations of the world, these military powers of the world, to have all the messengers and envoys and ambassadors go out to the nations to gather them to uh, Israel, the good and the bad and the ugly. There's got to be enough time. So you're only talking about maybe bring Jesus back a few days early. So instead of the bows of wrath lasting 45 days, I'm thinking more like 40. How long did Jesus get weakened before he got went under the test of Satan? 40 days and 40 nights. I don't see Jesus allowing his people to be weakened more than 40 days before they go under this final test of Satan. And you might say, what final test of Satan? They failed the fifth seal test. Yes, but during the siege of Jerusalem, which is the sixth trumpet and seventh trumpet periods, the 430-day siege, okay, 
So this 435 day period will be shortened, I think, to 430 days, just like Ezekiel 3 and 4 says it will. But when they see Gog the Assyrian, the false prophet, all his commanders holding up tenderloins, the finest of wines, over the, the siege wall, Zechariah 14 should be coming to mind, holding it up saying, wouldn't you like to come out and get some of this food for your babies, milk for your babies, medicine for your babies? All you have to do is be a part of my kingdom and bow before me. And denounce Yah, the Holy One of Israel, and deny, denounce His Christ, Jesus, and bow to me. And you could be part of my kingdom, and I'll give you all these things. They're going to be tempted. Like Jesus was tempted when He was at His most weakest point. And that's what Israel is going to have to go under during the sixth and seventh trumpets. And we also know that at, at, during the time of the sixth trumpet, 200 million jihadists are going throughout the seven continents of the world, coming to a neighborhood near you. And you'll be tested. As soon as you say things like that, people just turn you off. Oh, I don't need any more bad news in my life. Click. That's why preachers don't preach this in, on Sundays. The flock would leave. I don't want to hear that. I come for a good word and some good news. I don't want to hear all that. Now, I don't blame you, brother, but don't you want to know the truth? Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. I say again, from the Almighty. So when we get to Joel chapter 2 and we start talking about Gog the Assyrian's rod of anger, hired razor, flying the bee army coming against the land, and I, and I tell you and I show you in Joel 2 that Father's claiming it, calling in his camp his army, don't forget about this verse in chapter 1, verse 15, from the Almighty. That's what's meant by Isaiah 7 and 8. I am whistling for this army, Father says. This is just like he did with King Sennacherib and King Nebuchadnezzar. He's doing it again, but this time much worse. It is, is not the food cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed shrivels under the clod. Storehouses are in shambles. Barns are broken down, for the grain has withered. How the animals groan, the herds of cattle are restless, because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep suffer punishment. From who? Almighty God. Don't forget that. O oh Lord, to you I cry out, for fire has devoured the open pastures, and a flame has burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field also cry out to you, for the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the open pastures. Now that's Joel 1. Now let me say something before we start Joel 2. When I'm showing you all of this planned curse upon Israel, and explaining to you that this is from Almighty God, and this is something that Father promised the forefathers of Israel, and Father calls them his army, his camp, in this next chapter, do not think I'm encouraging you, when the time comes, to join the Antichrist army and to help him defeat Israel. Don't you dare think that's what I'm telling you. Because the Bible makes it clear that when Father is done using this northern army of Gog, the Assyrian, to chastise his people, He's going to kill them all. He's going to burn them all with fire in the presence of his angels and himself. All right? So don't think I'm trying to encourage you to join this army. You know, i got to stop and realize what I'm saying and what it sounds like in your ears. Because you may not know everything that I know about the 70th week. So I may add some confusion. Okay, this is the devil's army. Father's claiming responsibility for organizing it and pushing them and putting the hooks in their jaws and sending them against his people. But make no mistake about it. The people who fight in this army are of their the same spirit as their father, the devil. And do you understand what I'm saying? Father says, when I'm done using them, I'm going to kill them all and send them to hell for eternity. So even though he's calling it his army, his camp, to do his bidding, just like Nebuchadnezzar and Sennacherib, when he's done using them, 
letting Satan do what he wants to do for a while, for a period of time, for one hour. When he's done using Satan, all who were drawn to Satan shall be burned and destroyed and, and tempted, excuse me, tortured and suffer torture for eternity. So don't be drawn to this army. Be the ones that stand up. And don't fight against this army. All right. What you need to do is just hide yourselves. But be ready when they find you, if they find you, these jihadists, 200 million jihadists that go throughout the world. If they find you and ask you to uh, state and claim once and for all, while you're under the knife, or the gun, who your God is, who do you worship, you make sure you say that God, my heavenly Father, is Yah, or some version of Yah, the Holy One of Israel, and His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, is my Lord. All right? Have that answer ready. That's how you defeat them, is by speaking the truth. That doesn't mean they're not going to kill you. But don't worry, a few weeks or months later, Jesus promises you. He's bringing you back to life. So if you say you believe that, then have your testimony ready. All right? But pray that you won't be found by these jihadists. Pray that you won't, that you'll be kept from this hour of trial, Mark of the Beast test. That doesn't mean by a first seal rapture. There's no such thing, brothers and sisters. The, resur the rapture follows the resurrection. It's all in the twinkling of an eye. And that happens on the day that you get your crown of rejoicing, your day official day of adoption, um, you know, your unspeakable joy. You become heirs of the kingdom. All right, the day that you get all of these things is the, the day of your change. You're not going to be uh, in heaven for seven years and not have been given any of those things. All right? You don't get your rest until the day of his glorious appearing. Hallelujah. See, see the uh, study that I've done recently on that, the revealing of Jesus Christ. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming for it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come, great and strong, like of whom uh, has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. Obviously, that's not talking about Jesus' immortal armies. All right, But even the ten kings who turn against the beast, their army, the sheer number of them, won't be as large as what comes against Israel in Egypt and the land at the sixth seal, seventh seal, first trumpet. Gog's nor the first northern army, all right? Nothing will be like that as, as far as sheer numbers of bodies coming against Israel. Nor will there ever be. But uh, brothers and sisters, let's get this straight right now. The day of the Lord. A lot of people think that the day of the Lord doesn't even begin until Jesus descends with a shout on the last day of the age. Okay, A lot of people believe that. That is not true. The day of the Lord is what's in the scroll. It begins at the first trumpet. Do you understand? <coughs> the day of the Lord is the wrath of the Lord of hosts on his people, the seven trumpet judgments, and then at the seventh bowl, we begin the battle of the great day of God Almighty. That's called the day of his fierce anger on his enemies. To get even more specific, the day of the Lord is the first four trumpets, the wrath of the Lord of hosts on his people. The next three trumpets, fifth trumpet, sixth trump, trumpet, and seventh trumpet are the three woes of the book of Revelation. That's called the wrath of the Lord of hosts. Uh, excuse me, the fierce wrath of the Lord of hosts on his people. You got it? So the first four trumpets is the wrath of the Lord of hosts on his people. Trumpets five, six, and seven is the fierce wrath. That's those three woes of the Lord of hosts on his people. You know what? Let me back up for a minute because what I just said is incorrect and it can get confusing. 
And if you really want to know more about the day of the Lord, see the, the two lessons that I did before this. Let me start over. The first four trumpets of the day of the Lord is the wrath of the Lord of hosts on his people. The three woes, the fifth trumpet, sixth trumpet, and seventh trumpet, is the day of his fierce anger on his people. That's the three woes. All right? And then, at the pouring of the seventh bowl, now Father brings Jesus, and Jesus musters his armies for battle of Isaiah chapter 13. The my sanctified ones, the my mighty ones. You know, you've got the ten uh, kings of Revelation 17 turning against the beast cities and burning her with fire. All right. That's talking of all talking about the battle of the great day of God Almighty that happens after the seventh bowl pouring. That is called the day of his fierce anger on his enemies. All right. So just one more time and then we'll leave it alone. The day of the Lord includes the first four trumpets of the curse, wrath of the Lord of hosts on his people. Uh, trumpets 5, 6, and 7, the day of his fierce anger on his people. And then you have after the seventh bowl pouring, appearing of Jesus Christ, you have the day of his fierce anger continued, but now it's on his enemies. And all who try to steal Jesus' inheritance, his holy people and his holy uh, city, Jerusalem. Do you understand? All right, that's all the day of the Lord. Now, a lot of other titles come into mind or come into play here. For example, I'll, I'll say one more thing, then I'll stop on this subject. The day of his fierce anger on his enemies, which is the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Stop calling it the battle of Armageddon. That's not what the Bible calls it. They're gathered to Armageddon, but the Bible calls it in Revelation the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now, it has many other titles. The wrath of the Lamb. Uh, you know, Jesus comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance. You know, Zephaniah 1.8. Uh, 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 Nahum 1.8. Zephaniah 1.18. And so many others. Micah 3. Micah 4. Hallelujah. Lots of titles. Now, uh, continuing on with Joel chapter 2, we see a, a brief mention of the Antichrist army here. A people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been. All right. And I, you could, you, I could have made the next sentence, or you could say the last part of verse 2. I could have left it gray, but I decided to make it the color of the millennium. Nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. Okay, It's talking about during the time of peace, during the millennium. We're not going to have anything like this going on. Now back to the chastisement. You know, Here we go. This is the first trumpet. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. That sounds a lot like the lingo of the sixth trumpet, but it's not. He's describing the beginning of this attack, which starts the curse. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them. It's brothers and sisters. It is so important that you catch that. Because if you don't, you might start getting confused on which army this is and which seal, trumpet, or bowl it is. got to catch that. The land of Israel is like the Garden of Eden before them. What does that mean? First of all, it proves that Ezekiel 38 and Psalm 83 are talking about the same attack. All right? And it's at the first trumpet. Or you could say the afternoon, the six and seven seals are loose. All right? There is no war before the big war. Okay? The big war is what's next. Got it? This land of Israel is going to be like the Garden of Eden, almost, at this first trumpet. That doesn't mean that things are perfect. Wickedness abounds. Jesus hasn't come yet. And this is not talking about after the millennium, at the end of the millennium. When we are told that during the millennium, the Middle East will become the Garden of Eden again. Most of them. Now there's some beast cities where we're told that no one human will ever live in that city again. But all of Israel and a lot of the Middle East between the Nile River Basin and the Euphrates River Basin, Syria and Egypt, it is all going to become like the Garden of Eden while Jesus is ruling the planet for a thousand years. 
Okay, but this is the first trumpet. And behind them a desolate wilderness, surely nothing shall escape them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses. See, it's describing Gog the Assyrians, hired razor flying the bee army. You see it in gray. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses and like swift steeds, so they run. With a noise like chariots. Over mountain tops they leap, like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble. Like a strong people set in battle array, before them the people writhe in pain. Now, how much of this army is Turkish and Russian and Iranian? I don't know. My guess would be probably 50 to 75 percent, as far as the military equipment anyways. Maybe not the sheer number of people. A lot of them are coming from the continent of Africa and around the world. Before them the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained of color. That's part of the curse. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like many men of war. Everyone marches in formation. They do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like, the, like a thief. Brothers and sisters, a couple, th couple thoughts right now we got to clear up. Number one, this is what's meant by the day of the Lord comes as a thief. Again, quit thinking when you hear day of the Lord, Jesus has just appeared. Oh no. Okay, the day of the Lord starts at the first trumpet. It comes like a thief. Here's Gong the Assyrian's army coming against the land, you know. Yeah, they're saving Jerusalem for last, but they're dealing with Haifa and Tel Aviv and such. All right, they're 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 taking they're. It's like locust upon Haifa. It's like locust upon Tel Aviv. All right. They have. There's no Israeli military going out to fight. You know, Russian Turkish missiles have destroyed the uh, Israeli air force base. And air defense is right off the bat. Boom, boom, boom. Within a few hours, Israel is just left. Now we're talking hand-to-hand -hand combat. The people are just hiding with their families. It's going to be a swift attack. Remember, everyone's involved. Even Jordan's involved. All right? Everyone's involved at the first trumpet. And another thought is, when you're reading stuff like this, don't confuse this with Zechariah 14. All right, We're not talking about uh, the end of the siege of Jerusalem just yet. It's the same army. I say again, this army at the end of the sixth bowl that you read about in Zechariah 14, just before Jesus appears, that's climbing into the windows and raping the women of, of Jerusalem at the sixth bowl, it's the same army, but this is describing uh, what's going to happen to cities north. The ones on the Lebanese border, all right, on the Syrian border, all right, the ones that are going to get hit first. This is a first trumpet event, got it? Now watch this. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. Okay, right about now, a lot of people are saying, look, brother, that's the signs that occur just before Jesus is appearing. What you don't understand is there are three signs in the sun, moon, and stars during the curse. Three. One happens to start the day of the Lord. The second one happens at the fourth trumpet to signify that one-third of the earth is about to die and one-third of Israel is about to go into captivity. That happens at the fourth trumpet just before the three woes. Just before Father's day of his fierce anger on his people begin. Got it? Three signs. And if you look at some of my timelines, especially on my... Uh, uh, either my 70th week of Daniel very detailed timeline or my 70th week four landscape pages timeline, you'll see all of the passages in the Bible that deal with the sun and moon and stars being darkened 
during the 70th week of Daniel's day of the Lord. And I break them all down into the first trumpet, fourth trumpet, and seventh bowl. I break them all down for you. And once you learn how to tell which one it is, then you'll have it down. You, you look at who's doing the plundering and who is being plundered. And then you'll be able to tell, whoa, that's not Jesus. That's the Antichrist at the first trumpet. Or you might read one passage and go, oh, yeah. I think we'll see it when we get to chapter 3 of Joel. You'll see it. Oh, that's Jesus. That's his appearing. That's Matthew 24 lingo right there. So you'll be able to tell the difference. But just because, look right here, the Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great. Do not think that's Revelation 19 armies of heaven led by Jesus Christ of Nazareth in glory. Oh no, this is Isaiah 7 and 8 lingo, meaning that Father's the one who whistles for them. He's orchestrating this curse. But this is the Antichrist army. And you say, well, brother, quit saying that. It says it's Lord's army. Oh, just like he claimed Sennacherib's army, just like he claimed Nebuchadnezzar's army. He claims it. It's his doing. He doesn't lie and say, oh, I had nothing to do with that. No, Father's saying, I have everything to do with that. All right? But it's he's led by Gog the Assyrian. Father puts hooks in his jaws and brings him back and has him attack Israel. Father's orchestrating it. But this is not being led by Jesus. This is being led by Gog the Assyrian, who shall come to power in Mosul, Iraq, says Nahum, Chapter 1, verse 11. Nahum 1 is all about the coming battle of the great day of God Almighty that begins at the pouring of the seventh bowl. For strong is the one, capital O, that's Jesus, who executes his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Well, here you could say it's Lord God Almighty, or you could say it's the Trinity, executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Okay. Now this is not the great and awesome day of the Lord. That is the day of his fierce anger on his enemies called the wrath of the Lamb. Day of punishment, day of payment, day of recompense. It has lots of titles. This is the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. This is talking about the seven trumpet judgments on his people. Now we're having some yellow fifth seal warnings. That needs to be read to his people. But why wait to the fifth seal to warn Israel when you can start saying this to Israel now? Father wants you to use your mouth for me to use my mouth and warn his people before all of this comes. So they can repent, so he can relent from bringing this promised curse. Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Remember, brothers and sisters, if Israel fails this fifth seal test, this last chance to get Father to relent, if they fail this last chance, this 12 or 13 months of the fifth seal period, and they spend all their time persecuting the poor and needy Christians in Israel, who are trying to tell them, uh, whatever you do, don't bow before him, that's Satan. All right, when, if, if, if they persecute the Christians... Then the curse is coming. And if the curse comes, Jeremiah 25 says that all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth shall drink of this cup of madness at the seventh bowl battle of the great day of God Almighty. When all of New York City, Manhattan, L.A., Oakland, San Francisco, Atlanta, Cleveland, you getting it? St. Louis, every single building will crash to the ground regardless of who's in it. It's called the day the towers fall, the worst earthquake of all time, at the world shaking at the presence of Almighty God. That's what's coming upon the world if Israel fails the fifth seal test. That's why I say it would behoove us to help Israel pass it. Now, I can't tell you what's going to happen to those cities if, if Father doesn't have to bring the curse. The wicked are still going to be sought out and destroyed. But I can't tell you for sure what the devastation level is going to be in America. But I can tell you what it's going to be like if Father continues on with this established coming curse. 
if Israel doesn't do anything to stop, Father, I can tell you your city is going to be wiped out. It will be the worst earthquake of all time. But this earth trembling we just saw in early chapter 2, that's the earth shaking. And you see it in other books of the Bible, the Old Testament, as Gog is passing through the land. Father says, I'm getting your attention, Israel, as you're donning sackcloth. You're going to be doing it as the upper floor is going to be falling on your heads. Just to start the curse. Just to let you know, this is the real deal. This is the promised time of the end of my people. The end has come upon my people. You're about to die. And those left alive are going into captivity. So the earth is going to shake in Israel as Gog is advancing upon Haifa and Tel Aviv. Blow the trumpet in Zion, in Jerusalem, consecrate a fast. Oh, let's go, let's go back and read the yellow. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. Again, you have to do this, Israel, before the fifth seal is over. And he relents from doing harm. Okay, that's Malachi chapter 4. That's the way Father ends the entire Old Testament in Malachi 4 by letting you know Elijah's going to have a little bit of time during those 42 months of testimony to help Israel uh, pass this fifth seal test. I believe about the first 12 months of the 42 months Elijah will have to get the hearts of the sons back to the hearts of the fathers in Israel. So Father can relent. And leave a blessing behind. Yeah, who knows if Father will do that? During, well, we know that Father won't do that unless they do all of these things. Do you see this? And this also assumes you understand that they have to bow before His Son, Jesus. All right? While under strong delusion. While under strong delusion. The odds are not good in Vegas. For Israel passing this test. Again, all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth will have to drink of this cup of madness if Father has to bring this curse. All right, boom, now he's bringing it. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babies, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber, meaning don't waste your time getting married, and the bride from her dressing room. Why? Because he wants to see you, uh, all the families, out in the Times Square, all huddling in black, dressed in black, donning sackcloth, and crying out to the Lord, have mercy. But he's saying, I'm not bringing mercy this time. I want to see you do all this. You're going to do all of this, but it isn't going to help. Not but when the first trumpet comes. Spare, let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should you say among the peoples, where is their God? Well, first of all, when Father brings the curse, he's not going to let the people of the world and their evil neighbors and surrounding peoples rule over them for eternity. Israel will rule over their neighbors for eternity. Do I need to repeat that again? I get that. I want that to happen, and it's going to happen. Regardless of whether Father brings the curse or not, Israel will end up, in the end, ruling over the people around them and the world, and it'll actually be a blessing to their neighbors to have Israel, under the leadership of Jesus, ruling over them. It'll be a blessing to the people, and they will very much be happy. They will. Now, Father decides to start talking about the millennium in verse 18 of chapter 2. That's why it's in purple. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. He's talking about, at, not after the first trumpet, after the seven trumpet judgments are complete. After the it is done. After the battle of the great day of God Almighty. After the setting of his hand a second time to recover the remnant from the beast cities. All right. We start turning the Middle East into the Garden of Eden. He does it. When we start rebuilding the buildings that he wants rebuilt, the way he wants it built, see Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. There's going to be sacrifices again during the millennium. Jesus' law is going to go forth. It's his law. 
Things are maybe a little bit different. All right. But he's going to do the things the way that he wants to do. That's going to honor his father and give glory to him as well. The Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil. Now, when he says his people, is that the body of Christ during the millennium? Yes. But remember, there's not anything, there's no such thing as two separate flocks during the millennium. There's not like, well, the, Im, the immortal body of Christ glows light purple, and the immortal body of the chosen seed light of Jacob glows yellow. You're all glowing white. You're all one family. There's not two flocks. There's not natural sons. There's not adopted sons. You're all glowing white. Now, just the chosen natural sons, not all of the called natural sons, just the chosen ones from the first 4,000 years, and the ch chosen body of Christ from the last 2,000 years, all together will be one people called his people, Israel. You will be called the holy people, Israel. You will be called uh, daughters and sons of Jerusalem, Zion. Okay, these are titles given to you. Do you understand? We're not the followers of Jesus during the millennium. You're his people. You're his family. And you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you reproach among the nations. Now here's Jesus showing up, but I will remove far from you the northern army. Again, don't confuse this with the second northern army during the battle of the great day of God Almighty, which is the ten kings turning against the beast cities after the strong delusion is removed at the blowing of the seventh trumpet when the messengers, envoys, and ambassadors go out to the nations to say, look, the Bible was true all along. After seeing the events of the seventh trumpet take place in Jerusalem, the two witnesses standing on their feet, slowly ascending to heaven, an uh, uh, earthquake in Jerusalem, one-tenth of the city falls, uh, 7,000 people die exactly. All this happens at the seventh trumpet. 42 months of strong delusion is over. And mess messengers, envoys, and ambassadors go out throughout the nations to gather them against the beast cities like Baghdad, Tyre, Lebanon, Sidon, Lebanon, Amman, Jordan, Bolshara, Jordan, Damascus, Syria. All right. Many others on the hit list of Jesus when he returns. And you might say, what are you talking about? A hit list that Jesus comes back with? Yes, it's all the chapters in the Bible called the burden against, the word of the Lord against, send a fire against, kindle a fire against. Oh, that's about the, about the past, brother. No, it's not. That's about the battle of the great day of God Almighty. You need to quit looking at the Word of God without your 70th week of Daniel goggles on. You need to put them on, go back and read, reread uh, the books of the Old Testament between uh, Psalms and Malachi. Not to mention all the other books before that that are giving you clues about what the 70th week is going to be like, especially the day Jesus appears. What do you think was meant in 1 Kings 18? Four water pots poured three times. Then comes the sacrifice lit with the burning that came down from the sky. What do you think that was telling you about? It's pointing you to the day that Jesus appears. But don't be confused by the fire coming down from sky because the Antichrist false prophet is going to call fire down from the sky during the fifth seal. And maybe multiple times throughout the curse. I don't know. But don't confuse that with what 1 Kings 18 is talking about. When Elijah had that showdown with the 450 prophets of Baal to find out who the real God is, that's what's going to go, that go down when Jesus appears. This fire is going to be a breath of fire and brimstone of Isaiah 30, verses 27 through 33, coming out of the mouth and nostrils of Almighty God, Lord God Jesus, saying, all right, that sound of a consuming fire, but we'll be able to stand in it. We won't even get singed or even feel the heat from it in our new immortal bodies. Hallelujah. But I will remove far from you this northern army and will drive him away into a barren and desolate land with his face toward the eastern sea and his back towards the western sea. His stench. Why is it? Why is he stinking? Because he's dead. Will come up and his foul odor will rise. 
Think about this wine press just in the Valley of Decision, Valley of Jehoshaphat alone. That's not even counting all the threshing floors. I'm talking about just within the wedding hall, the pure stench. All right? There'll be a lot of birds and the beasts there to feed on these carcasses, to clean up this mess. And then it'll take seven months to bury the bones in the Valley of, what's it called, Hemingog? Not sure if I pronounced that right. Because he has done monstrous things, this northern army. But the he really is talking about the Antichrist called the Assyrian, who won't go by that name, who shall lead them. Now let's talk about the millennium that follows after the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beast of the field, for the open pastures, uh, pastures are springing up, and the trees bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. When you read verse 23, you need to be thinking about Malachi 4. That's who Jesus is marrying. He's marrying the holy people called the daughters and sons of Jerusalem, Zion. And you might say, well, where is the Gentile followers of Jesus Christ fall into that? That is who you become. You become the daughters and sons of Jerusalem, Zion, true Israel, the chosen ones from the called ones. You're grafted on. That's the day of your adoption. You're no longer a stepchild, red hair or not, all right? You become Israel, my elect. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ who grow horns when you hear me make that claim, uh, I'll pray for you. You better go back and read Hebrews, Romans, Galatians 3 and 4. You better find out who you are, follower of Jesus Christ. Or, that tells me, I'm not your judge, but you better be careful. Because I'm beginning to wonder if the Holy Spirit is teaching you. Alright? Be careful. I'm not your judge. I'm not worthy to even loose your sandals. I'm least of the flock. Biggest sinners of them all. I'm not worthy to say these things to you. All right? But the Holy Spirit's talking to some of you right now. Don't grow horns when people tell you you are not separate from Israel after the day of adoption. You're not. You are one. You are his people, Zion. Oh, I hope, I hope and pray many of you are getting that for the first time. Be glad then, O you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Brothers and sisters, are some of you right now thinking that the body of Christ are going to be like angels, which is true, and we're going to spend all of our time up in the clouds, kind of like overseeing the Lord and his people. It's like we're not really part of them. We're up there in the clouds. We're kind of like overseers to make sure everything's going right. But Jesus is down there on earth with his people from Israel. But we're up there and we're not really one of them. But yet we're all family of God. Brothers and sisters, I hope that's none of you thinking that. Because that would be pretty sad if things are this nice and wonderful down here on earth. And you get your new body to do nothing more than just fly like a bird all day and never get to land. All right. That would be pretty sad. Okay. Your new body is going to be a living body. All right. You're going to be living. You're going to be experiencing love. All right. You're not going to be experiencing marriage. Not that kind of love. You're not going to be bearing children. You women getting your new glorified body. You're going to be around 20 years old. All right, the age that uh, uh, someone has to be to fight in, in God's army, all right, that's about the age you're going to be young and you're going to be thriving. All right, you're going to be old enough to drink wine. <laughs> you are, but you're not going to get drunk. Okay, the Lord told you He's going to have wine again when He comes in His glorified body. All right, read Zechariah 9. The young men, the young women are going to be drinking wine 
during certain feast days at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You're going to be drinking wine with the human mortals who are left alive. That holy stump who's going to be fed by us, fed by Jesus. Remember the disciples helped Jesus pass out the food? All right. What, do you, what are the poor and needy, holy stump, what are they going to be eating? These foolish virgins who aren't glorified that we and our groom are going to be feeding on the mountains of Israel during the marriage supper of the Lamb. Where do these animals come from? We're not eating humans. The birds and beasts are eating them. The animals come from Ezekiel 39. Lambs, rams, goats, oxen, which were brought by Gog the Assyrian's army during the besieging of Jerusalem. Right? During the 6th and 7th trumpet periods, all these animals are going to be brought. Well, guess what? They're going to be bust to pieces and even uh, gutted, if you would, by 66-pound hailstones and lightning. And then the fire comes out of the mouth of Jesus. They're going to be roasted to perfection. All right? That's what the Bible says. Ezekiel 39, Zechariah 9, Revelation 19. All right? All of these nines, it's the marriage supper of the Lamb. And there'll be more... Uh, suppers being presented to the poor people throughout the Middle East in chapters like Isaiah 25, the Feast of Choice Pieces, you know, and, and uh, the, the passages about Bosra Jordan, Basira Jordan, and Edom, all right, threshing floors. The result of the threshing floors is the poor and needy get to eat, and the enemies of Christ, the enemies of Israel, get plundered during the battle of the great day of God Almighty, just like they plundered in early Joel 2. Israel. Now it'll be their turn to get plundered. Got it? All right. So yes, these are all, all the purples about the millennium. Um, verse 25. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. My great army, which I sent among you, among you, See, right here sums it up. When I said earlier in Joel 2 that this army that's being sent among them, which is led by Gog the Assyrian, that shall rise to power in Mosul, Iraq, says Nahum chapter 1, which is Daniel 11, 21. All right, the arising to power in Mosul of the vile one, the wicked one, the wicked counselor, verse 21 of Daniel 11. To loose the first seal, that's Revelation 6, first seal is Daniel 11, 21. Is then interesting that the wonderful counselor is brought forth by Mary in verse 21 of Matthew 1. And here in Daniel 11, verse 21, is the wicked counselor of Nahum 1 coming to power. The vile one to loose the first seal. The first seal is the crowning of the Antichrist in Mosul. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. I know what I'm talking about. The revealing of the Antichrist to the world when everybody catches on at the fifth seal abomination of desolation event and they gasp, that's him. And they all in unison go, that's him at the fifth seal. That's the revealing of the Antichrist. But for those few who are really watching the events of Daniel 11, we'll know when the first seal is loosed at his crowning in Mosul. I don't know if Putin's going to realize or try to tell the world that he's got uh, Islam blood in him from one relative, you know, or maybe he descends from a line of caliphs, or maybe it has nothing to do with Putin. Maybe it's uh, at a Turk from Turkey, you know, or maybe it's someone we've never heard of. I don't know. But the crowning will happen to loose the first seal in Mosul, ancient Nineveh, says Nahum chapter 1, which is Daniel eleven twenty one. When does the 70th week of Daniel start? At verse 21? No, it starts way back in verse 13. You have the first 220 days of the 70th week of Daniel is Daniel eleven thirteen through 20. And you have two different caliphs involved. And then at verse 21, here comes this third caliph during the 70th week of Daniel to loose the first seal when he is crowned to power and comes in peaceably and seizes the kingdom by intrigue. 
All right, that's Daniel eleven twenty one, the vile one, the wicked counselor. How do you know that it's 220 days between Daniel eleven thirteen and Daniel eleven twenty one? How do you know? You know because of the prophecy found in Daniel 8, verses 23 through 25. There's 2,300 days scheduled until Daniel the prophet shall arise during the resurrection to life. 2,300 days. That'll be shortened by a few days, possibly five. Remember? But that's scheduled from the loosing of the first seal until he's destroyed by non-human means by the battle of the great day of God Almighty at the seventh bowl when Jesus appears. All right? So we only have to put up with this man who gets crowned in Mosul for 2,300 days or less. Be shortened by a few days for the sake of the elect. So, if that's 2,300 days, what's the length of a seven-year period? 84 30-day months. 2,520 days. So, you subtract 2,300 from 2,520. Gives you the length from Daniel 11:13 to the first seal being loosed in Daniel 11:21. That period. Read those verses where you have two caliphs involved. That's a 220-day period. And you say, well, brother, surely the Bible is not going to give us all of that specificity. Oh, yeah, he does. The, only, the sad thing is very few people are going to notice. Very few people are going to be considered the Church of Philadelphia-like people during the 70th week and will be kept from the hour of trial, mark of the beast test, because you persevered and because you're faithful and you read your Bible every day and you, you, and you study these things. You're going to know years in advance to start fleeing the cities, start fleeing uh, the nuclear power plants, to start getting out in a safe location and start building up your supplies. Now, if you uh, have to give witness when the time comes, then you give witness. And if you die, you die. You have the promise of a new life a few months later. All right, hang in there. Make Father proud. But the rest of the world, guess what? They're going to be stuck like Chuck. Why? Because things happen really fast once the fifth seal is loosed. And you have the revealing of that same man, but now he's going to be revealed to the world in Jerusalem at the abomination of desolation event spoken of in Daniel 11, verses 29 through 35. But you're going to know when he's crowned secretly, or at least fairly quietly, in Mosul. If you watch Mosul News, Daniel 11, 21, we're going to know. Those of us who just have this great desire to study the 70th week of Daniel, and to watch the news, and watching for certain events, don't be that one that's and I've had people tell me this, brothers and sisters, while well, I'm watching for the fifth seal abomination of desolation event. All the beginning of sorrows, first four seals, well, that's some that may be a little hard to catch because people die all the time. There's wars all the time. But when I see the fifth seal abomination of desolation event, then I'll know, all right, that the fifth seal has been loosed. Well, that's fine, brothers and sisters, but why not be part of the elect who are watching so closely that they know when the first seal is loosed, when this man is crowned in Mosul, says Nahum chapter 1 and Daniel eleven twenty one. Hallelujah. Enough said about that. But again, my great army, which I sent among you, matches exactly what I've said about this northern army that attacks Israel to begin the curse. Father claims it. He calls it my great army, my camp. All right. But he's telling you, which I sent among you, Israel. And he's, he doesn't mean you, Israel, is his enemies. It's still his people. But he's spanking you using Satan's army. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. See, he's saying, well, I'm bringing the millennium after all this is over. Things are going to be wonderful. And this army that I sent among you you're going to be eating at the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
Now you won't eat them. The birds and the beasts will eat their carcasses. Hip here, leg there, uh, torso over here. But you're going to be eating their animals of Ezekiel 39 and drinking their wine because nobody in the Middle East can drink the water. Nobody. Why? Because Father's raining down meteors and, and volcanic eruptions and ash and wormwood. Ain't nobody drinking the waters in Israel. So these armies that come against Israel got to bring their own water and bring their own wine. To, so you'll have liquids to drink. But that's referring to the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19. It's part of the plundering of your enemies. <clears throat> After Father uses this great army to plunder Israel, what does Isaiah 26 say? And other passages? Then it'll be Israel's turn to plunder them, those left alive. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. He doesn't mean during the 70th week. He's saying during the millennium, after your dross has been purged, you shall never be put to shame again. That's what that means. A lot of people like to say, Father's not going to bring the Antichrist against Israel. He might try, but Israel, I mean, Jesus is going to come as soon as Israel gets attacked. And Israel will never have to face shame during the 70th week. That's not what that verse is talking about. That's saying after this curse, after this great army is brought upon them, after two-thirds of Zechariah 13, Israel has been killed and one-third led away into captivity. And it shall come to pass afterward. After what? After the curse is finished. It is done as spoken in Revelation 16, 17. That's when the curse is finished, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. In fact, this is talking about even after the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Again, we're talking about the early days of the millennium, when all of the remnant are beginning to come back to Israel. Oh, what a time of rejoicing, even though there's no buildings to live in. And there's bodies and military equipment burning everywhere. All right? Just like you see in these video clips of World War II and World War I. Okay? It's quite the mess. It takes seven years to clean it up, the Bible says in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Seven years to clean up this mess just in Israel. We're not even talking about the beast cities. But while they're cleaning up this mess, while they're returning, while they're hugging on Jesus... Maybe they're even seeing us, the immortals, and we're all singing and dancing and teaching and, and, and binding up of their wounds and people getting band-aids and first aids and medical tents being set up. All right, all the healing going on. All of this is going to be done through the Spirit. So there's not going to be any doubt in anyone's mind that Jesus, who they see before them, is their long-awaited Messiah. And also on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And you might say, well, seeing the curse and the battle of the great day of God Almighty wasn't enough for people. Jesus has to bring on the fireworks of the early days of the millennium. He sure is. He's going to put on quite the show. No one's going to doubt that he is Lord God Almighty and brought by his Father. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, every time you see that lingo, you need to ask yourself, is that the first trumpet sign? Is that the fourth trumpet sign? It, or is that the uh, seventh bowl sign just before the sign of the Son of Man appears above the wedding hall? Then here comes Jesus descending with a shout. Attack! As he comes quickly, speedily, swiftly, just like the Antichrist. Much earlier came swiftly, speedily, quickly. All right? In a moment. The Antichrist came. Jesus is like, okay, imposter, this is how it's really done. And Jesus attacks suddenly. So, 
Here, it's the great and awesome day of the Lord. This is the day of his fierce anger on his enemies, the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Not to be confused with the entire day of the Lord. So this is not the same sign in the sun and moon that we saw earlier in Joel. This is the seventh bowl, third of three signs. And you might say, well, brother, but how do you know for sure that's not talking about the same moment in time? Because you can always tell there are actually dozens or at least a dozen passages in the Bible that talks about these signs in the sun, moon, and stars of the second half of the 70th week. Sometimes Gog the Assyrian army is doing the plundering. Sometimes it's Jesus' army is doing the plundering during the battle of the great day of God Almighty. See the difference? Always look to see who's doing the plundering and who's being plundered. Is Israel being plundered or is Israel being led by Jesus and now plundering their enemies? Do you see that? So, again, do not assume that all of these signs in the sun, moon, and stars are the same event, the appearing of Jesus Christ at the seventh bowl. <coughs> and don't forget there's less than a 1% chance that Jesus will be coming at the first trumpet. But you won't mistake him for the Antichrist because he'll be coming in that cherub of Ezekiel chapter 1, riding on the swift clouds with all the angels of heaven, not to mention the immortal body of Christ, or the I should say the immortal bride of Christ from the last 6,000 years. And there'll be no buildings left standing on the day that the true Messiah comes. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why do I have that in red with yellow font? Why? Why just didn't I just leave this purple with yellow font? Because this is talking about the battle of the great day of God Almighty, and when the ten kings who turn against the beast burn her with fire. This is the threshing floors being threshed during the battle of the great day of God Almighty, which does not last for five minutes. It does not last for one hour. It does not last for a 24-hour period. It lasts for many days, says Isaiah chapter 28. This threshing of all the Middle East threshing floors down into Sudan, Ethiopia, Isaiah 18 should be coming to mind. Jeremiah 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, which you thought were past events about past, past prophecies about past events are actually about the battle of the great day of God Almighty. When Jesus brings this hit list, even when he mentions names like King Nebuchadnezzar, he's talking about aggressor titles, plunderer titles. He doesn't say Gog the Assyrian, or he doesn't say the appointed general that leads the ten kings who turns against the beast. But he names King Nebuchadnezzar just as an aggressor or plunderer title to let you know here comes another plunderer. But you look at Jeremiah 47, 48, 49, 50, 51. It's all about the end of the age. It's all about the battle of the great day of God Almighty when Jesus leads his my sanctified ones of Isaiah 13. And these chapters, the end Jeremiah, match Isaiah 13. It's talking about all of Jesus' weapons of indignation. It talks about Jesus using his uh, Ezekiel 37 army. Did you know that? He calls it the My Battle Axe. In Jeremiah 15, 51, he calls it the uh, My Threshing Sledge Machine with Sharp Teeth. In Isaiah 41, the My Sanctified Ones. In Isaiah 13, all right? Uh, you got the threshers, the threshing going on in the book of Micah by the bride of, of, of Christ from the last 6,000 years. Hallelujah. You're grafted onto that tree. You, brothers and sisters, Gentile follower of Jesus Christ, you become that immortal battle axe. You become, you get grafted onto that immortal threshing sledge machine with sharp teeth. You're going to go out and help recover the remnant of Israel. Those uh, people so weak they can barely stand up. They look like Holocaust victims. You're going to bring them back to Israel and help heal them and help strengthen them. You know, maybe you're just rendering first aid. I'm not trying to say you're going to act like God touched them and they're healed. Who knows what Jesus will tell us to do? He's our commander. This is referring, listen to me, brothers and sisters, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. If you think that passage there in Joel 2 is just talking about uh, a message saying become a follower of Jesus Christ during the last 2,000 years and don't worry, everything will end up okay. Okay, That's a true statement, but that's not what's being said here. What's being said here is talking about the battle of the great day of God Almighty when not only is Jesus and his my sanctified ones treading and trampling and threshing, all right, and cutting off, all right, but also Revelation 17's second northern army led by the appointed general of uh, Jeremiah 51. He's also mentioned at the end of Isaiah 14 is that fiery flying serpent that comes from the serpent's roots like a viper, right, to turn against the beast. All right, Isaiah 14, Jeremiah 50, 51. Baghdad is Babylon, the great city. That's where the uh, um, the beast image shall be set up in the land of Shinar, land of the Chaldeans in Zechariah 5. It's also Shishak, save for last, in Jeremiah 25. Baghdad, which sits on the Euphrates River, that's going to send out this jihad horde during the sixth trumpet and give its orders from the Euphrates River. All right, Babylon, Baghdad will be the seat, the headquarters, not Jerusalem, of the beast after he gets crowned. Now, he'll do a lot, him and his false prophet will be working a lot of magic. All right, during the fifth seal, that time of strong delusion, trying to get Israel to fail that test, which they will. All right. Whew. But anyways, this whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved during the battle of the great day of God Almighty does not mean you're going to be immortalized. It's not a second chance to become immortalized. They've already missed that chance, these foolish virgins. But what this is talking about is hide yourself for a little moment until the indignation has passed. Well, what's the indignation? It is the day of his fierce anger on his enemies. It's the uh, day that the ten kings turn against the beast and basically kill everything that moves in the Middle East. That's why Jesus says, I'm going to shelter you. I'm going to hide you from the wrath of the Lamb. Because not only am I blowing fire all over the place, but you're going to have to put up with these ten kings passing through the land. This second northern army killing anything that moves. Especially people who have the mark of the beast, but they're dropping bombs everywhere. So go hide yourselves. What does Jesus tell the people in Jerusalem who are the foolish virgins at his on the day of his wedding? What does Jesus tell the foolish virgins? Go to Bethany, quick. I'm about to blow fire on Jerusalem and purify it. Run for your lives. King David, glorified, opens the gate and leads them. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. He will lead them out of Jerusalem, and they will go 2.5 miles east to Bethany Azal, says Zechariah 14, through the Mount of Olives. Run for your lives. Hide yourself for a little moment. <laughs> I don't know where that exit came from. Hide yourself for a little moment. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord, your life shall be spared. That doesn't mean you'll get glorified. Now, you will get glorified during the great white throne judgment if you're judged to be a member of the family after all the teaching of the millennium and you live out your days during the millennium and you die and Father will judge you at the great white throne judgment. But you won't be killed during the battle of the great day of God Almighty if you beg Jesus, please don't kill me and don't let the 10 king appointed general accidentally kill me during the time of all this threshing of all the threshing floors. Angels will protect you because you are mark free. You are mark free. You were a virgin to Yah, the Holy One of Israel. You may not have had a personal relationship with Jesus, all right? But you didn't belong to Satan or you would have taken his mark. You just didn't know who Jesus was, but you knew that was not your God, Yah, the Holy One of Israel. I mean, you were willing to let your children die in your arms because you were faithful to Yah, but you did not know who Jesus was. But now you're given the chance to enter the millennial period in your mortal bodies and, and make beautiful babies and continue that seed line going. And Jesus loved to be surrounded by mortal babies. All right, there's no such thing as immortal babies. They're all probably the age of around 2021. 
He wants to see mortal babies during his reign. Who can blame him? So you virgins, foolish virgins, you need to go hide now because we've got the many days of Isaiah 28's overflowing scourge, winnowing fan that's going to thresh the threshing floors of using all of Jesus' weapons of indignation above Isaiah 13 and Jeremiah uh, 50 and 51 and Isaiah 41 and Micah 4. Arise and thresh, O Zion. And people go, oh, that's just the IDF fighting during this this." This upcoming battle with the Antichrist. No, it's not. Arise and thresh is Ezekiel 37. Hallelujah. It's the my sanctified ones in glory. Fighting from the above. Coming down on the shoulders of their enemies. Hallelujah. But that's what that means, verse 32. Hide yourself for a little moment until the indignation of the wrath of the Lamb has passed. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Here we go, Joel 3. Again, we've seen two signs in the sun, moon, and stars in Joel 2. All right, We had the first trumpet sign. We saw the seventh bowl sign at the appearing of Jesus. And now, Joel 3 is going to give us more information about the appearing of Jesus. Are you ready? For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. That is referring to the passage in the Old Testament in Isaiah, where the Lord is going to set his hand a second time. It might be Isaiah 11. Don't quote me on that from memory. All right. That's when now the battle is over. The seventh bowl, early days in the millennium, overflowing scourge, winnowing fan is over. All the people with the mark of the beast are dead. All right, now it's time to go recover the remnant. Those people who are under the yoke in Baghdad, who were fleeing when the 10 kings set them free, and Jesus shows up and makes them suddenly run away from her, the harlot, because Jesus is about to <sighs> blow fire on Baghdad. All right, you got it? As the final end to her destruction. I don't wish that on the people of Baghdad. But the Bible does not offend me. I'm not going to not teach it just because it sounds ugly. And I don't want to make paint my Lord as being mean and ugly. I'm going to teach what the Bible says about the 70th week of Daniel. And I'm not going to judge the word and go, I'm not teaching that in my church. I'm not teaching that to my family. That makes Jesus sound mean. It makes God sound mean. And you know what? My God is a loving God. I'm not going to teach that. That just sounds mean. I must not have the correct understanding. Because when you think like that, when you say things to your deacons like that, you're saying, this offends me. And I don't understand it. And I don't know why God thinks like that. In one moment, the next moment, he's acting all nice and loving. In the next moment, he's acting all mean and judging and killing. And I don't like it. And executing people. I don't like that talk. I'm not going to teach that in my church. That tells God that the Word of God offends you, that you don't like the way He is orchestrating things to bring about the end of this age of Satan. Be careful, brothers and sisters, when you judge God, when you judge His Word, and you are ashamed of His Word, and you don't teach it, and you use the excuse, well, I might have the wrong understanding, and I don't want to be a false teacher or a false prophet, so I'll just leave that half of the Bible alone, and I'll just teach the loving Jesus. Well, you should teach the loving Jesus. right? But don't be ashamed of the other half of the Word of God. Israel needs to be warned. If you love God's family and you love His people, all right, Jew or Gentile, you need to warn Israel and you need to warn, warn your people what Father is about to do to bring this age of Satan to an end. And how there's going to be this time of testing before we have the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And nothing, and I mean nothing, can stop the promised curse on the last generation of Israel except uh, them turning to Jesus during the fifth seal. In Satan's face, tell him no. All right, you go to you know where. I am bowing before Jesus Christ of Nazareth, my Lord, the only begotten Son of God. All right, get them ready, brothers and sisters, for what's coming. And you'll use the excuse, you know, this may not happen for another hundred years. 
Why do I need to um, kill the good times? Why do I need to worry my family? Okay, let me give you some reasons before we go into Joel 3 why you might want to start teaching this stuff. Okay, number one, when did Jesus say he's coming back? I don't know. When did he say I'm coming back? Well, he said he's coming back. And you might say, brother, don't go to the Old Testament. That's not Jesus. It absolutely is Jesus talking. The word of God made flesh. What did he say in Hosea 6 verses 1 through 3? I'm paraphrasing. I'm going to come back and heal up your wounds. And I'm going to revive you after two days. Is that 2,000 years? I think so. You got any uh, um, witnesses to that? Well, how about uh, Matthew 20? One day of labor is worth what? One denarius. One day of labor in Father's vineyard. Well, what did our good example, how much did he give the innkeeper? Saying, I got to go, but I'm coming back. Continue my work and heal up uh, the bruises and wounds of this person until I come back. How much money did he give him and say that should do till I return? Two denarii, two days of labor in Father's vineyard. Does that not match Hosea 6, 1 through 3, which tells you, Hosea 6 even tells you, he's talking about, uh, seek the knowledge of the coming of the Lord. I'm paraphrasing. Hallelujah. Now, what about the first prophecy found in Isaiah 7? Within 65 years, Ephraim shall be broken. If you think that has nothing to do with Daniel 12, verse 7, when Jesus says, I'm not coming back until the power of the holy people and the holy city are completely broken and shattered. All right, Daniel 12, 7. Uh, that's exactly what the first prophecy in Isaiah 7 is talking about. And then Isaiah 7 goes immediately into Gog the Assyrian, the final Antichrist army that God brings upon his people in Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 8. goes right into it. But first, the word of God to those few Church of Philadelphia members who will be kept from the hour of trial, Mark of the Beast test. Anyone who will listen, who goes to the garden every day and ask, seeks, knocks, ask, seeks, knocks. The door of Revelation 4 is open to you. The mystery of all the things that shall come to pass are told to you. Why? Because you ask, seek, knock in the garden every single day. You're persevering. Lord, tell me more about the 70th week. Tell me more about the 70th week and your coming and the coming of your kingdom. And he goes, well, let's talk about Isaiah 7. Within 65 years, Ephraim, or you could say the drunkards of Ephraim, or you could say Israel, all right, in the last days. Because again, Isaiah 7 and 8 is all about the last days. The latter days, the time of the first trumpet being blown in Zion. Here comes Gog the Assyrian passing through. All right? That's exactly what Isaiah 7 and 8 is about. But he opens it by telling you, no man will ever set up a king over Jerusalem but me. And I'm bringing my boy, and I'm setting him up as ruler from Jerusalem. Within 65 years, oh, you Ephraim, you shall be broken. It's exactly what... Uh, Daniel 12, 7 says, the, broken, the breaking and shattering of his people during the curse, the power of his people and the power of his holy city shall be broken. That's the it is done. All right. The it is done of Revelation 16, 17. It is accomplished. Within 65 years of what? I don't know. But my guess is it's May, June of 1967. Add 65 years, and what does that come to? May, June of 2032. But he says, within that amount of time, I'll have been able to say it is done. Wow. If I'm correct, count seven years before that, and you got to start to the 70th week of Daniel. And you might say, brother, how sure are you? And all I can tell you is 90%. Don't know for sure. Maybe we're not supposed to count from 1967. But isn't it interesting how that matches perfectly the Hosea 6, the Matthew 20, and the Luke 10 parables and prophecies. It matches them perfect. After two days, 2,000 years from the day I left, I'm coming back and I'm going to revive you and I'm going to heal you. 
on the greatest day of healing the world has ever seen. So if you said, brother, what's a, what year is Jesus returning? I would say, I don't know. God hasn't told me. But if you said, well, do you have any years that are high watch years for the start of the 70th week? I would say, I sure do. It's the spring of, of 2025. A high watch year. I'm watching. But see, I know that a pre-trib rapture is a lie. So I'm not telling you the rapture occurs in the spring of 2025. I'm not saying that. You're not going to be gathered to your Lord until he appears in glory. And that's the day that you get your crown of rejoicing, your official uh, day of adoption, your rest. That's when you become heirs of the kingdom. That's the day that Jesus is revealed in power and great glory at the seventh bowl. On the last day of the age, and we shall be mustered for battle. I'm not no army. I'm a bride. <laughs> Your wedding day is going to be a military wedding. Hallelujah. I don't care if you're just in the military band or the military choir, but you're going to be part of this threshing. Following your Lord, watching him in action, giving praise and honor and glory from, from the skies. So yes, 2025 is a high watch year for me, but don't forget the prophecy in Isaiah 7 says within. Maybe Father will decide to bring it a little early. 2023, 2024, no man knoweth. But I can tell you today, my understanding today is no later than spring 2025, the 70th week of Daniel will begin. Could I be wrong? Absolutely. Is there a 1% chance that Israel is going to pass even under strong delusion, the fifth seal test, the first 12 months of the 42 months? You know, yeah. And then in that case, instead of Jesus coming at 2020. 2032, it'd be more like 2028, somewhere around in there. No man knoweth. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, 2025 or sooner in the spring will be a high watch year. Now, when he says within 65 years, I believe that he's talking about in the year of, uh, as in the years of a hired man. What that means is if you have a sentence in jail, or you become a, a bond servant, and you will are told as a bond servant, your last day that you are will be my bond servant is this day, and then the following morning you will be set free. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. That means that the within means you're gonna fill you're gonna fulfill your bond servant time. It's basically telling you on that day. It's just another if it says within. And this is me guessing and assuming that it's as in the year of a hired years of a hired man, meaning you, meaning the your relatives may not know for sure what day you get free from jail, but you know because you're xing out each day on the calendar, or it's like a military person, all right, doing a short tour overseas. You know the day that you're flying back to the U.S. All right. That's what I think is being said there within 65 years, Isaiah 7. After two days, Hosea 6. All right. Those who eagerly watch and are marking the days off on the calendar, even though no man knoweth the day or the hour, you're, you're watching so eagerly that you're going to know when that event of Daniel 11:21 to loose the first seal takes place in Mosul. Got it? All right, we got to get going. Here we go, Joel 3. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage. Who? All the nations being gathered together at the sixth bowl and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat on account of my people, my heritage. Remember, now it's time to plunder those who plunder his people. But Now, whom they have scattered amongst the nations. Okay, so the my people are going to be scattered amongst the nations. Uh, during the time of Gog the Assyrian, the final Antichrist, during his reign, the people of Israel, that one-third of Zechariah 13, are going to be taken to the beast cities as slaves, under the yoke of slavery and bondage. They have also divided up my land. 
They have cast lots for my people, have given a boy as payment for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. And we read stuff like this as Gentile followers of Jesus and go, hey, this is between God and Israel. It's got nothing to do with me and my rapture. Oh, it's got everything to do with you and your rapture. All right. Indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre, Lebanon, and Sidon, Lebanon, and all the coast of Philistia, and Lebanon, and Gaza? Will you retaliate against me? But if you retaliate against me swiftly and speedily, I will return your retaliation upon your own head. He's talking to the evil neighbors and surrounding peoples of Jeremiah 12 and Zechariah 12. This is Israel's neighbors. This swiftly and speedily is not talking about Gog the Assyrian at the first trumpet coming swiftly and speedily in a moment. All right, quickly. This is talking about Lord God Jesus Christ at the pouring of the seventh bowl after the sixth bowl gathering of the nations to Israel. All right, they've been attacking Israel since the first trumpet, but they really show up when it's time to take Jerusalem at Zechariah 14 at the end of the sixth bowl period. They're just, ooh, you're just oozing. They just, they can taste it. They want to take Jerusalem so bad from Israel. All right? This swiftly and speedily is, behold, I am coming quickly. That's exactly what Jesus means. All right? The day of the Lord at the first trumpet comes like a thief. But now it's time for the thief to get plundered. Jesus comes swiftly, speedily, quickly in a moment in the twinkling of an eye to musters his armies of heaven for battle above the wedding hall. Because you have taken my silver and my gold, in other words, he's saying you have plundered my people, and have carried into your temples, especially Baghdad, my prized possessions, also the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem, you have sold to the Greeks. In western Turkey, possibly even Greece itself, uh, the whole, all seven continents are going to be turning towards Gog and worshiping him. And anyone in Israel or any Gentile follower of Jesus who refuses to become part of this kingdom uh, is going to be persecuted. Maybe even we might even be taken as slaves in our country. I don't know. We'll see. That you may remove them far from their borders. Talking about uh, the one-third going into captivity. Here we go. Behold, I will raise them out of the place to which you have sold them, and I will return your retaliation upon your head. This is either talking about Jesus uh, immortalizing his my sanctified ones, which includes the Gentile followers of Jesus Christ. Both flocks become one and are called the my sanctified ones. Don't let anyone tell you, oh, he's just talking about Israel. Oh, no. Okay, you are grafted onto their tree. Jesus is the root of their tree. If you want to belong to Jesus, you better be very happy with becoming Israel on the day, this day, when both flocks become one. And I will raise them out of the place to which you have sold them, and I will return your retaliation upon your own head. Now, that's either referring to of the ten tribes of Israel being sold off centuries ago when northern Israel was defeated by King Sennacherib and they have migrated throughout all seven continents of the world and then the chosen ones from the called seed line all right and many of them are Christians today and don't even know they have Israeli heritage uh, as far as bloodline but that's not even important um, so yeah, that's either talking about people who were taken away during the time of King Sennacherib, or this passage could be very much talking about this uh, 70th week of Daniel, second half, the curse, when one-third of Israel is taken away to the beast cities as slaves. It could just simply be talking about that. But behold, I will raise them, okay? Uh, that's not talking about the ten kings, I don't believe. It could be. It could be just simply talking about the ten kings, the my mighty ones, or it may be talking about crusaders, last generation crusaders, but who aren't glorified, because if they're glorified, they're the my sanctified ones. But either way, he's going to use the my sanctified ones and the my mighty ones 
uh, and also the ten kings who turn against the beast. It's all making up his weapons of indignation and retaliating on the beast cities. Okay, any way you slice it. I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off where the Lord has spoken. There's going to be a lot of uh, slavery activity going on against the beast cities by the ten kings after Jesus appears. And you might say, that doesn't sound like something Jesus would do. Father's working all this out for everyone's good who's still alive at the end of the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Because these people who are going to be put under bondage, okay, as part, first of all, it's part of their payment. All right, they're going to spend a little bit of time in helping build these cities in Israel and helping rebuild the planet. These people of the beast cities who are left alive, who are probably the, the weaker ones, because they must not have the mark of the beast or they would die at the hands of Jesus when he blows fire on the marked ones. So they must not have the mark, but yet they're suffering the payment against their city. And they will be uh, told, your people came against Israel during the 70th week, so you will work for us. I'm not saying they're necessarily going to be whipped. But they'll be told, if you want to eat, there's no food to be had. If you want to eat, if you want to drink, you will do what these leaders of Israel will have you to do. You will do what the immortal army of Jesus Christ tells you to do. You will do what the angels tell you to do in the rebuilding of Jesus' kingdom. If he wants you to serve in the medical tent, you will do it to get your daily rations of food and water. All right? If you want, he If he wants you to use you to clean up the mess that your armies made in Israel. Okay, you're going to be cleaning up the tires, helping to tow the military equipment off of Father's land. I mean, but in the end, eventually it'll be the Garden of Eden and everyone will be happy. Even Egypt and Assyria, who came against God's people, those left alive, will be blessed during the millennial reign of Christ. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. This is talking about um, the sixth bowl. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong, and assemble and come, all you nations. And this is Jeremiah 47, 48, 49, 50, 51. And gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down to... There and some of them talking about uh, this is talking about the sixth bowl just before Jesus appears. Go down to Jerusalem. Go down into the valley of Armageddon, north of Jerusalem. All right. Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Remember what just happened forty to forty-five days earlier. The forty-two months of the strong delusion has ended. The Revelation 14 should be coming to mind. The three court reporting angels of Daniel 7 has just gone throughout the world and say, everyone come against the beast cities. The strong delusion is removed. They've seen the events of the Bible take place and now there's no confusion. But those who have taken the mark are looking at their hand, they're looking at their forehead and going, wow, I've got six weeks to live or less. I wish I wouldn't have taken the mark of the beast. I was fooled. No, you were drawn to to the spirit of your father, the devil. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Even though that's in Revelation 14, five chapters before uh, Revelation 19, which begins the battle of the great day of God Almighty, in Revelation 14, it is talking about Jesus is appearing five chapters later. Okay. In other words, Revelation 19 is giving you more information about Revelation 14, giving you more details. All right? Because Revelation 14 includes the five or six weeks of the bowls of wrath, and Revelation 14 talks about Jesus' appearing on the day of judgment to render the wrath of the Lamb day of his fierce anger on his enemies. So Revelation 14 covers all of the seventh bowl period. Excuse me. Let me say that again. Revelation 14 covers all of the seventh trumpet period, which is the seven bowls. 
the first six bowls, and then it starts talking about harvest time and thrusting the sickle. That's the seventh bowl. But when the three angels are going out, that's the six bowls of the seventh trumpet. When darkness begins to fall upon the beast cities and the nations are awakened and they realize that the events of the seventh trumpet just prove the Bible is true. Father removes the strong delusion. And then the second half of Revelation 14 starts talking about the seventh bowl, beginning to the battle of the great day of God Almighty on the first night when Jesus appears. And then this threshing will go on for many nights, says Isaiah 28. But here we're going to have that sign again that we saw in late Joel 2. We see it again in Joel 3, and it's talking about the seventh bowl. That second half of Revelation 14. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. From the skies above Jerusalem, the wedding hall. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Now also, put in the sickle, the harvest is ripe, can be said, in Jeremiah 15, 51, about the fall of Baghdad. That's also Revelation 17, 18, Isaiah 13. All right. It's going to be the time of her harvest, her appointed time of visitation. All right. Many days after Jerusalem's time of visitation on the wedding night. Okay. But this is talking about the wine press, not about Baghdad's threshing floor. This is the wedding hall, Valley of Jehoshaphat Valley of Decision. And you see it uh, mentioned later, right here in the next verse. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. There's not very many good in the wedding hall. There's some foolish virgins in the wedding hall that are good. Did you hear what I said, brother? They're good. They're not being destroyed. They're not being glorified either. They're going to be uh, taken to safety by glorified King David to Azal Bethany. All right. So he's judging between the wheat and the tares. He's judging between the wheat and the I, um, I'm going to become wheat, but I'm not just wheat yet, foolish virgins, and then the tares, those with the mark of the beast, either Israeli or non-Israeli. The end it could be the enemies of Israel. Anyone who's marked is the tares. Anyone who is ready to be glorified is the wheat. And anybody who's a foolish virgin that's marked free and still alive, all right, they need to hide themselves for a little moment. Isaiah 16 says a safe place to be during the battle of the great day of God Almighty. I'm not saying the whole curse. I used to think the whole curse, but definitely during the battle of the great day of God Almighty is the fords of the Arnon River mentioned in Isaiah 16. That's going to be a safe place to hide yourself for a little moment until this indignation of the battle of the great day of God Almighty is over. Azal, Bethany, Isaiah, today on Google Earth, 2.5 miles east of Jerusalem. That's going to be a safe place. So this is the wine press of uh, Zion. For the wine press is full. There's only one wine press. There's many threshing floors. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. This is talking about the last couple verses of Revelation 14. 200 uh, miles, 1,600 furlongs of creek bed saturated with four foot deep blood. That's either talking about the distance from Bashan, Jordan to Basira, Jordan, Bolsara of Isaiah 63, which is 1,600 furlongs, straight up, straight line distance as the crow flies up the Jordan River Valley from Bashan to Basira, 200 miles, 1,600 furlongs, or it's talking about starting at the Valley of Jehoshaphat, creek bed, and running all the way down to the Red Sea. With all the twists and turns, that could also be what's meant by the 1,600 furlongs of the wine press. Either way, you're talking about a lot of dead bodies and horses and animals. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now, this day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision is talking about the appearing of Jesus Christ. And you might say, aha, brother, see, that's the day of the Lord. I told you that's the day of the Lord, but it's all the day of the Lord from the first trumpet to the end of the battle, the great day of God Almighty. And some people might argue and say even the millennium is considered the day of the Lord. And I think they're right. 
All right? But this doesn't mean the day of the Lord starts when Jesus appears. We saw in Joel 1 and 2 that that's not the case. The day of the Lord starts in Daniel 11:40b when Gog the Assyrian passes through the land, when the curse begins, and it's time to don sackcloth, and Israel is attacked with such a force that they don't even go out to fight. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will grow dark, and the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. You know, you, you, you people read that and they go, my Lord doesn't come back to kill millions of people. Uh, yes, he does. Well, I'm not going to preach that or teach that. I know you're not because you haven't yet. So why would you begin now? That offends me. I know it offends you. That's why you don't teach it. Well, my congregation wouldn't accept it. Do you care? Are you worried about paying the light bill that bad? Well, the Lord's counting on me to keep the church doors open. No, he's not, brother. He's not. He's counting on you to teach the Word of God. That message is for somebody. I don't know who it is, but I hope you took it to heart. If he wants to keep your lights on, he'll keep them on. If the people leave because you're teaching the truth, then let them leave. And you just stand out there on the street corner and teach holding up your sign. But I won't be able to pay my own house bills. Why do you care? Why do you care? Your house is about to be destroyed. At the seventh bowl, there ain't going to be any buildings left standing. I hope you got a pop-up tent out in the middle of nowhere somewhere, and you better hope the, the earth underneath you doesn't crack open. Of course, if you're ready to meet your Lord in the air, then you won't have to worry about it anyways. This is the same sign in the sun and moon shown at the end of Joel 2, but this is not the same sign in the moon mentioned earlier in Joel that deals with the first trumpet attacked by on Israel by Gog the Assyrian. So the sun and moon and stars sign is mentioned three times in the book of Joel. The first time is the first trumpet. The second and third time is the seventh bowl. But Joel does not mention the sign in the sun and moon and stars of the fourth trumpet. That's not mentioned in the book of Joel, but you do see it in the book of Revelation. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Now you might say, well, when we're immortalized and we're lifted up like a banner of jewels above the land of the wedding hall, he is sheltering us. You know, you can say that, but that's not really what that's talking about. That's talking about the foolish virgins who aren't immortalized. They weren't accounted worthy. All right. But they will be at the great white throne judgment. But they're going to be left alive in their mortal bodies. All right. They have to be sheltered in Bethany. They have to be sheltered in, sheltered in Isaiah 16's fords of the Arnon River in the southeast corner of the Dead Sea in Jordan. All right, they have to be sheltered because we're getting ready to go through many days of threshing the threshing floors, beginning with the Lord treading the wine press alone in the wedding hall. And then we have many days of threshing the various threshing floors from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River by Almighty God himself. And then you have the ten kings even going further east and west into Elam and down into Ethiopia and Sudan. All right, Isaiah 18, Jeremiah 49. All right, so there's even a larger area of threshing done by the ten kings who turn against the beast. And you better hide yourself for a little moment if you weren't glorified. But if you have the mark of the beast, you will die during this time, probably on the first night, the appearing of Jesus Christ. But the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Father, Yah, the Holy One of Israel, is bringing his only begotten Son, Jesus, Lord God Jesus, God the Son, the second member of the Trinity, and setting him up as ruler of the planet from Zion, Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem shall be holy. And no aliens shall ever pass through her again. And you might say, well, what about the end of the millennium? We, we see in Revelation 20, you know, that uh, um, 
Uh, the Satan will be loosed for a time there at the end of the millennium. We're going to go through one final sifting and gathering to Satan of all who belong to him before we go into eternity. Yes, they'll attack the camp of the saints, but they'll never make it to it before they even get to the camp of the saints. All right. They'll be burned with fire before they even get there. They won't pass through the Holy Land at the end of the millennium. They'll just be en route. God blesses his people, and it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. This is the latter rain. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord, and the water, the valley of Acacias. All right, remember, we're talking about turning it into the Garden of Eden. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom a desolate wilderness, because of violence against the people of Judah. Edom has a lot of passages in it about Jesus destroying it, but he'll leave a few left alive. There'll be quite a few in Egypt left alive. Edom, of course, is southern Jordan. And you got the famous passages about uh, uh, the threshing floor of Basira, Jordan. There'll be a large forward operating base of the enemy there down there in southern Jordan, not too far from Petra and, and Tefila. Bosra, Basira, Jordan. Because of violence against the people of Judah, all right, let's end it. For they have shed innocent blood in their land, but in their land, you see that? Christians in Jordan, run for your lives. Christians in Egypt, Run for your lives. Do not wait until the 70th week begins here in just a few years. If you are within the sound of my voice, don't wait till the fifth seal abomination of desolation event to flee. Get out of those countries. Now you might say, well, all right, brother, I want to come to your country. Can I stay at your house? No, I ain't going to lie to you. I ain't going to give you false hope. Okay? I can barely pay my own bills. You can't come here to my house. But... You need to go somewhere, get out of the Middle East, and go somewhere. Now, all seven continents, are Christians are going to be persecuted. But some countries will, will be under worse persecution than others. All right, There's more people in certain countries that hate the followers of Jesus Christ more than other countries. Go to a country. I'm not even saying America is going to be safe. I have no idea. I don't know what's going to happen to America, but I can tell you this much. When Jesus appears at the seventh bowl and the earth suffers the worst earthquake of all time and splits open every county, every province, every city, all the towers shall fall. Any country like America that is packed full of nuclear power plants are all going to burst open and you're going to have one heck of a, of a radiation cloud encircling the earth. Now, Lord God, Jesus. We'll probably clean that up pretty quick. But I don't know if he's going to clean it up in an hour or 50 years. You get what I'm saying? So if you're not glorified or you have some family that isn't glorified, even if they don't take the mark of the beast, they may die a very tough death just due to the radiation. Even if they survive the earthquake and the burning of the cities and they're out there in a pop-up tent, and they've got some supplies to last them a year, when that nuclear radiation, and, and we may even get hit by the enemy. Speaking of radiation, I don't know. But it doesn't look good for us. Am I anti-nuclear power? Yes, for that reason. Because I know what the Bible says is coming. And anybody with any wisdom at all who's a Christian should never, ever, ever support uh, nuclear power plants. How can you, knowing that this earthquake is coming, you might say, well, it'll do us good until the Lord gives us our in, in new immortal bodies. Well, yeah, you're right. But are you sure every member of your family is going to get a new immortal body? Why in the world would you make them suffer through all this nuclear radiation knowing this earthquake is coming? All right, don't want to go off on a tangent. But Judah shall abide forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will acquit them of the guilt of bloodshed, whom I had not acquitted, for the Lord dwells in Zion. When will he acquit them? Revelation 16, 17, when their dross has been purged, and he comes as their redeemer to fight their battles. 
All right. That's when he shall quit them. But he still leaves the door open during the fifth seal, but it doesn't look good under strong delusion that hasn't even started yet that they will accept Father's gift. Brothers and sisters, I hope this has blessed you. Now you should understand Joel like never before. Uh, a lot of people have gotten Joel 2 wrong. They knew that Joel 3 was the return of Christ. They understood that Joel 1 was a warning about some kind of Antichrist army. But that Joel 2 confused them. Uh, early parts of Joel 2, brothers and sisters, is talk, still talking about Gog the Assyrian coming upon the land. And then the latter parts of Joel 2 start talking about Jesus coming at the seventh bowl. Hallelujah. I hope this helps. You can download this. I'll leave the link. It's see Joel like never before. Don't forget, brothers and sisters, that um, I've already done see Isaiah like never before. See Jeremiah like never before. All right. Now you can see Joel like never before. I don't know what book of the Bible I'll do next. Maybe a short one, maybe a long one. Most likely a short one. I'd like to get some of the short ones out of the way first. But uh, almost all the Bible, brothers and sisters, from Psalms to Malachi is about your near future. It's not just a history lesson. It's time that it's taught that way. Hallelujah. All right, brothers and sisters, I can't wait to see you next time. God bless.